as humans we're drawn toward just doing what makes us happy or what makes or what feels good oftentimes we will go for something that's comfortable and familiar even if it's not yeah. actually making us happy and it's not actually for making sure. us feel good because it's comfortable because we're scared of change if you're happy with the same old ways of dating if you enjoy sucking at communication and you have no desire to improve your romantic life then our podcast might not be for you but if you want some out of the box ideas to deepen your current relationships broaden your sexual horizons develop a better understanding of yourself or learn more about non-monogamy then you've come to the right place I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multi-Amory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're asking the question, are you ready to become polyamorous? Have you been thinking about polyamory but don't quite know if you're ready to take the plunge? Are there red flags to be aware of that show you shouldn't start a polyamorous journey? We're going to discuss all of that and more in today's episode. Yeah, this is our 201st episode. Yeah. That's amazing. So, like, <laughs> wow, it's been a long journey. It really has. Uh, and to celebrate that, we have cast Dedeker away. Um, yes no more (laughs) no we're kidding we love her but she's i think traveling today so she can't do that yeah she's traveling today yeah um but this is kind of fun it's sort of a recap episode from a couple things that we've done in the past um because you know we've had a lot of episodes on like opening up on deciding if you want to be polyamorous or not, if you're ready for it. So we're kind of uh, putting all those things into this episode, and it's a good way to start out our 200th from here on episodes and and kind of do a nice little recap. So uh, we wanted to split this up into two different sections. So the first section is going to be, you may be ready to become polyamorous if, and then the other section is, you may not be ready to become polyamorous if. Yeah. So... Let's dive into that. Um, Yeah, let's get started. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you may become, you may be ready to become polyamorous if you are already proactive as opposed to reactive when it comes to your sexual health. So that means you do things like you get regular STI testing. Um, You're really committed to discussing your sexual health with possible partners. Um, Also your expectations Because probably if you are interested in non-monogamy, you might be dating already, you might be single, um, or you might be in a committed monogamous relationship. And with that, I mean, hopefully you're already discussing things like sexual health with your partners. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that's something that you are already doing in your life anyway. But if it's not, Mm -hmm. it is very important. And something that... Something that we get very excited to share is results from a study that showed that consensually non-monogamous people versus monogamous people who were in this study, the consensually non-monogamous people had more sexual partners over the course of their life, but the same or lower incidence of STIs as their monogamous counterparts did. Uh, And we want to keep it that way. So if you're going to join this club... Uh, make sure be doing that. Yeah. Make sure that you are also taking care of your sexual health and taking responsibility for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's just obviously incredibly important to be talking about your sexual health with your potential partners. And I think there is this stigma on sex just in general, like it's something to not be discussed, but one Mm -hmm. does really need to be proactive about that because it's your, your health and your life at risk um, in some cases. So it is important uh, and just the kind thing to do for your partner for sure. Yeah. And and I guess the one thing I would add going along with that is that you've committed to educating yourself about sexual health and STIs because there's also a lot of misinformation and a lot of stigma out there where people will be, you know, overly worried about certain things, but maybe not cautious enough about other things because most of us rely on our, you know, education about STIs to come Which from was like bad. Well, it was bad in school and we rely on like For the most part the crap yeah. that our friends say or what we see on TV shows or movies, which is not a great source for this kind of information. 
No, not at all. So yes, educate yourself. Absolutely. And if uh, you're questioning something, then, you know, do your research for sure. Mm -hmm. Because more times than not, it's definitely not going to be the type of stigmas that you're maybe used to uh, regarding sexual health in general. But it's good to be prepared and be aware for sure. Yeah. And we've got a number of episodes about that that you should definitely go back and check out. Uh, With that, number two here is that you have a good self-awareness when it comes to things that you are good at in relationships and things that you need to work on. When things are difficult in your life, you have a good understanding of your own emotional bandwidth, like what you are capable of handling at different times and how to set boundaries and say no when you need to. Yeah, this is a really important one. Um, Because I think sometimes we aren't always aware of the things that we're good at or bad at in relationships. And we just kind of continue to go through relationships, making the same sort of mistakes over and over again. But if you are a person who's really willing to look at yourself and to say like, Hey, okay, this is something, you know, this is a pattern that keeps coming up over and over again, and maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And then you do the work to change that thing, then that's a really important thing to have in a polyamorous setting. I think just because there are so many unknowns that come at you for sure. And so many different emotions that you may not know were there that may come up when you are in this type of relationship structure. Yeah. And and we don't want that to sound like we mean things that you're like bad at in relationships. Like, you know, some people will but just the like, you know, the things that it may come up over and over again, you're like, wow, I always get jealous at X or I always like do this thing. Mm-hmm. And just kind of being aware of it and realizing that those are things that you can improve about yourself and that you are willing to to do that, right? That you have some awareness of that. So the next one that we wanted to talk about was that you have a little bit of Zen when you go into this type of relationship structure or any type of relationship structure. And what I mean by that is that you have good forms of emotional management techniques. So you know that like if you have a really stressful day at work, um, your family members are pissing you off for some reason, (laughs) uh, you can do things that can make you happy or put your you in like a Zen place. Um, Things like yoga or a meditation practice, um, regular exercise, stuff like that. So this is, again, really important just because you never know what's going to happen in situations in polyamorous relationships. So it's great to have emotional management techniques just so you can get yourself back to a place where you are happy and healthy. Yeah. And I do want to clarify with this one, though, that it's not like you have to be a Zen master who's never bothered by anything or who can always be in a good mood. That's not what we mean here. What we mean is just that you have a certain amount of, um, you know, like Emily said, like techniques, like you have things that you can do to at least get yourself to a place of neutral or to a place of... Yeah, like play a video game or... Right, right. It could be exercise or yoga or meditation, or it could be video games or reading books or, right, going for a walk. Like, there's a lot of different things this could be. And it just... I feel like it kind of comes down to sort of similar to what we were talking about earlier with kind of like your relationship skills, but Mm -hmm. that it's more about like your emotional skills. It's like the fact that you do have some, you know, regardless of what your kind of emotional landscape is like that you are proactive in like having techniques for how to manage that and how to understand that and how to have some amount of control over your own emotions. Yeah. And I think it's tough sometimes because, you know, you may have all the amazing techniques in the world and then all of a sudden something hits you that you're like, look, I can't, I just can't, even though I'm, I'm doing yoga, I'm doing, you know, certain things to try to get me back to zero or back to neutrality, it's not happening. So this is a challenging one, because you may have all of those techniques, and it may still not be working. But at least you have something there for you. And at least you're trying to get yourself back to a place of neutrality or being okay. It's just good to have these techniques there available to you. And if you don't have them, then maybe, you know, go to a yoga class or see if reading takes your mind off of a difficult day of work. Just try to implement something and see what works for you. Yeah, I think it's probably we should have said at the beginning of all of this that these are all things 
it isn't like you have to be perfect at all these things, right? For it's sure. just, these are some things Pick that and are, choose. they're going to help you have a better time. And as long as you're kind of aware that these are some important things to be working on, I think that's, you know, maybe even more important, just more as like a way, like things to look at, to evaluate rather than like check boxes of like, yes, I'm ready. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Number four is that you realize that you will probably make mistakes and you understand that that's part of the learning process. Um, and kind of part of that is learning to be kind to yourself in moments of distress when you are freaking out or you feel like you've screwed something up. Understand that like that's, that's normal, that mistakes are going to happen, right? That's, and that's true of anything, not just of polyamory, but you know, mistakes are going to happen. And if you can accept that, I think it can help you be a lot kinder to yourself and help that transition go more easily. Yeah. Oh man, this is a tough one (laughs) because I think definitely like I, I'm accustomed to like really beating myself over the head of you did this wrong. Mm. How dare you kind of thing, as opposed to being understanding of the fact that things go wrong sometimes and you just have to roll with the punches and, and know that you'll do better next time. Um, I agree with you though, that yeah, this is an incredibly important skill to have. And again, if you don't, I mean, I don't know I'm still working on this one for sure. (laughs) It's been like a lifelong journey. Um, maybe therapy would help (laughs) for sure as it would have in most things. But yeah, uh, I don't know. It, have you gotten better at this over the years, Jess? Yes and no. I go back and forth. Um, I'm yeah. I'm a little bit similar to you, Emily, where I tend to like really beat myself up over mistakes that I make. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, you know, even if they're not really mistakes, and maybe I see that later at the time, I feel like they are. And I tend to take, maybe take responsibility for things that aren't even in my control, uh, right? That aren't even things I had direct control oh, over. Oh, for sure. But I feel like, oh, well, yeah. maybe if I'd done this one random thing, then that could have been different. Somehow this is my fault. And yeah, it is really important to realize that. And I think this one helps having a good support network of having mm. other people in your life who understand that. Because absolutely, I think that at least for me, I feel like, you know, I got that way of thinking about making mistakes from my parents who I think felt that way about Mm. themselves about making mistakes. And so it's like establishing more of a support network that I have now, you know, with my friends and romantic partners of people who kind of get that and who kind of understand like that you don't have to be perfect all the time uh, and to kind of help remind you (laughs) that you're still okay. Even if you didn't do something perfectly. Yeah, I mean, that's a great friend right there is <laughs> someone who tells you like, hey, it's going to be okay if you screw up, like it's not the end of the world and you're still a good person. You're still a kind person. So yeah, it, that it, we didn't put that in this in this section, but having a good support network is incredibly important just in general. But it's also lovely to have when you're entering into a non-monogamous relationship. Oh, and yeah. people who will support you regardless of the type of relationship structure you're in. Yeah, that's kind of its own that's, that's a, its a own tough one. thing. Yeah. And that might be something that comes over time. That might not be something yeah. you have going in, but absolutely as you start connecting more with people in your local polyamorous communities, you can start to build more of that support network. It's not like you have to replace all your friends and family with new ones, but you know, get out of here. Yeah. Finding that sort of positive and accepting and like actually truly understanding what you're going through kind of support mm-hmm. network, um, like through our Patreon group through multi Amory yeah. or an in-person group or a little bit of each, like there's a lot of different options there. Absolutely. Yeah. So the next one we discussed a little bit before, but uh, we wanted to reiterate that you are committed to examining yourself and trying to do what is right, whether rather than just doing what's comfortable. This is another big one for sure, because I I think as humans, we often will gravitate towards the thing that like makes us feel the best or feel happy or feel okay, even if it's not necessarily like the kindest, nicest thing to do in the moment. Um, So I think that often the, the right decision 
what is it? Did Gandalf say that? Was what? it him? What did he say? He's like, uh, doing what is right rather than what is easy or something. Oh. Uh, I don't, or was I don't... that Dumbledore? <laughs> no, I think it was Dumbledore. <laughs> okay. A different bearded man. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. I'm not uh, winning nerd points today at all. But yes, what were you going to say, Jace? Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I think that that, um, that is it exactly. Kind of doing what's right instead of what's easy. And I think that just mm-hmm. to kind of add on to what you were saying earlier... I don't even think it's so much that as humans we're drawn toward just doing what makes us happy or what makes or what feels good is that I feel like oftentimes we will go for something that's comfortable and familiar, even if it's not actually making us happy and it's not actually making us feel good because it's comfortable because we're scared of change. And I think that for something like that, like, it, it uh, you know, takes a certain amount of courage and a certain amount of kind of resilience and interpersonal strength um, to say like, yeah, I'm going to keep challenging myself and I'm going to keep exploring these things and seeing what I can, you know, what I can do better, like how I can understand myself better and do my relationships better. And I think that what I've seen at least is people who are not willing to do that, who are like... No, I would rather just be comfortable in what I'm doing now. Just mm. kind of make things shitty for their polyamorous partners and um, for themselves, you know? Yeah. It's like you're trying to I mean, do something, but you're not willing to do the kind of deeper change to get there. Yeah. It, and I get it. Like to have a giant upheaval in your life, for example, if you're with a partner, it, you live with them and to leave them or to end the relationship, it would completely change your life. And that's a really drastic, difficult thing to do. For sure. Uh, But again, yeah, that's, that's why you said like the comfortable part doing what's right rather than what's comfortable. Um, And and if you're good at that, if you're good at like ending something, for example, if it is time, then that's, that's a great skill to have when going into non-monogamy because that's a difficult one for sure. And something that I think, perhaps a lot of monogamous people tend to do is stay with people maybe well past the time that they should just because, Hey, well, I I'm comfortable in this relationship. It, it's, you know, better more often than it's not. So I'm going to stay or it's 50 50 in terms of the time when it's good and when it's not. So I'm going to stay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah like, but that's not always the best thing to do. Like the stuff we talked about in our Science of Happy Relationships episode, if you go back and check mm-hmm. that one out, is that 50-50 is not a good ratio. <laughs> like, that's not a relationship you should stay in. But yeah. it's often more comfortable to just not rock the boat, not make any changes. Yeah. Yeah. I think this one's... Absolutely. I mean, honestly, all of these are really important life skills, just period. For, for sure. For your relationships or even just for, for any kind of life, right? These are important skills. We just have found that these things have kind of made the difference in, mm-hmm. in, in our personal lives, like the things that we did do well and the things we didn't do well. And what we've seen with all lots of other people that we've talked to through this podcast, kind of the things that tend to make a transition into polyamory go better, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So the next one, this one is specific to if you are in a monogamous relationship right now that you're thinking about opening up. And that is that uh, to be sure that your communication and your compassion and your mutual care for each other are in really great shape. The process of effectively opening up involves a lot more disentanglement than you might realize. And the way that we're kind of shown to do relationships by what we see in movies and TV shows and our stories and all that tends to be very codependent. It tends to be this thing of like, you complete me, right? You're going to be the other half of me, right? That like, I'm not complete without you. And one thing that does come up when you do allow yourselves to kind of have separate identities, which includes, you know, dating people separately from each other, but also just having separate identities, period, in terms of your hobbies and your friend groups and things like that, that it also provides you this really great opportunity for kind of seeing each other anew and kind of being mm-hmm. more excited and, and um, 
you know, being reminded of the things that drew you to this person in the first place. Because when you were first drawn to them, they weren't already half of you, right? They were their own person and that's what you were so attracted to in the first place. Yeah. So kind of like having that understanding in place and even doing some of that disentangling and like learning to see each other and see yourself as a whole person on your own and on their own, mm -hmm. even before opening up a relationship, even if you never open it up, is going to be hugely important uh, in terms of like the stability and the health of that relationship over the long term. Yeah, absolutely. And just like having a bit of independence from one another. I mean, you essentially said just that, but I think it is, it is really important. Uh, it is interesting. Like I'm on contract with some people and, and they're lovely and adorable, but they like they're the two couples are married to different people in different countries right now, okay. but they like call their significant other all the time, mm. like on every single break, which I find just so wow. interesting. Like I know multiple and times it, through the day. Yeah. Like multiple, multiple times through the day. Wow. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's pretty cute, but I'm also just like, in my head, I'm like, <laughs> How, well, like what do you have to talk about like really what is going on like you know I'm sitting there like reading a book or doing something else <laughs> on mine and I'm like wow they're talking to their significant other again and this is like the fifth time today it yeah. is it's just interesting like the difference in the level of like independence from one another and again totally nothing wrong with that it's it's super adorable it just is it is a different thing and I think if you are in a non-monogamous relationship, like the just calling one partner all the time is probably not going to happen. Maybe you'll spread yourself over multiple partners and call each of them a lot. But yeah, I don't know. It, it just is, is a different thing. But you end up getting yourself into trouble with that because it's like, yeah, on the one hand, where's the time for you? You know? Yes. I mean, I would argue that yeah. for the people even in monogamous relationships. I just I, think I agree. I just think in monogamy, you can get away with it a little easier. Yeah as long as you're not willing to have time for yourself. Um, but I feel like with polyamory though, it's like, say you are constantly in touch with your partner and like being apart from them, it's like, Oh, I have to constantly call them or text them or be in touch with them. Yeah. As soon as you start to develop any other kind of relationship, you're not going to have that sort of availability or time to constantly be in contact. And all of a sudden it's going to feel like something's wrong. As yeah. opposed to, we had a certain amount of independence and also a certain amount of connection, and that's great. So that's not going to have to change as much as mm -hmm. you pursue another relationship or that your partner does. Yeah. Right. Or like you were saying, Emily, where you're like constantly trying to be in touch with all of your partners. That's also making it so the people you are spending time with aren't getting the best quality time with you because you're For distracted sure. thinking about how much you have to contact whoever you're not with. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's great, like in the moment, if you're with someone to be able to speak to them, or if you have a moment when you're not in a date or something, or you're not like sitting around with your nesting partner or whatever, to be able to contact a partner quite quickly, but also give some time and space for yourself, because that's truly, truly important. And it shows that independence that all of you can have that you don't need to be codependent with the other person or with any one person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all of those things are important and it can be challenging, but yeah. And, and it's, like, a, it's a nice thing to be able to have, but it helps you realize that you're important to your partner because mm -hmm. of who you are and because you are important to them and not just because they can't live without you. Like, yeah, I think we've really sure. over romanticized in our culture, this idea of I can't live without you or you complete me. I think it's yeah. just, Ugh, it like gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, you know what I mean? Because it's just, I used to think that way. That's absolutely I how I thought. And it wasn't a healthy way to have relationships. And I realize that now looking back on it, but establishing yeah. that independence is just like, not even independence per se. I think some people think of that a little negatively in terms of a relationship. Like it means you don't care about other people, but like sure. a sense of self and a sense of them that's separate from you, I think is very valuable and very romantic actually. Yeah, no, I do too. And it, and it makes things more interesting too. Like when you get to come back on the phone with them finally and be like, look at all these amazing things that we've be each been doing mm -hmm. and working on instead of like, Okay, I'm going to tell you about the cheese it that I just ate. 
the vegan cheese it that I just ate. Uh-huh. I don't know. I'm sorry. I That's don't want to like. That's a great example. I like that. I, I don't want to like shit all over that either because it is it is sweet and like part of me was like how adorable is this but then i also was like this is weird i don't understand it and i couldn't do that but it would also be adorable once a day as opposed to every hour Oh, for sure right yeah it would be i agree (laughs) with you so okay um the next one is going to be uh, you might be ready to have a non-monogamous relationship if you aren't really trying to force the issue. And what I mean by that is that you have really thought long and hard about whether or not you want to be polyamorous. You've done a lot of research. You've read Dedeker's book. <laughs> yes. And you've soul-searched a little as well. Um, and also, you're not making this decision for anyone else. You're not trying to save a relationship that's failing. Uh, you you want to do it because of all the things that it's going to bring to your life. And yeah, th- this is an incredibly important one. Obviously, all of the other things that we just talked about, all of those skills, all of those things that you already do in your life are really important. But but this one, I, I think you absolutely must have hmm. in order to have a successful polyamorous relationship. Some people can be brought into this mindset and then maybe, you know, f- find out that they really love it. But if you're, you know, kicking and screaming internally going into it, that's yeah. that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Yeah, for sure. And it's not, it's not something that it, that means you'll never be able to do it or you'll never sure. be ready for it. But, but yeah, if it is something that you're just like very deeply uncomfortable about right now. Yeah, maybe, maybe don't. You know, I, I guess to kind of go back to the thing earlier about like, you know, trying to better yourself versus just doing what's comfortable. I think this is kind of the other side of that scale, where if it's something that just makes you all uncomfortable, you know, it's Mm -hmm. just too much on that side, that's not a good thing either, right? It's about keeping that in check, being like, okay, this is a little scary, maybe. This is a little out of my comfort zone, but it's not so much so that this just feels totally wrong to me. Totally. And that might change later. Right. Like Emily and I have shared our story of when we opened up our relationship years ago. And Emily kind of talked about that, where it was for her at first not comfortable, but then that changed. Yeah. And I mean, I had always had like a lot of idea that it could work and that maybe that was something that I would be interested in without knowing, you know, the terms for it. But initially, all of those those feelings came up, those jealous feelings or those really like sick to the stomach feelings when I saw that Chase was having a fun time with other women. And that was really challenging for me. But then with, I think, quite a lot of soul searching and and thinking about it and realizing that I could gain amazing things from it as well. That's when I really decided, hey, this is something that I can do. Mm -hmm. And for us, it didn't work out the first time. Like the first time yeah. that we tried to be polyamorous, it really didn't work out. Uh, and so that is to say that you don't have to make that same mistake of kind of a false mm-hmm. start. I actually don't recommend that way of going about it. Yeah, it ended up working out okay later, but right. but in the initial false start was was rather painful. But if we had had an episode like this and kind of some of these things to think about, we might have realized, okay, that's true. We could have this as a goal. But let's get these other things in place first, or at least kind of have a bit more of a sense of what were some things maybe we didn't even realize that we didn't have in place yet for ourselves um, or or in our relationship, just because we hadn't practiced those things. Because again, I think in monogamy, you can get away with not practicing a lot of uh, good habits in relationships. That doesn't mm-hmm. mean they're not still good for monogamous relationships. I think you can just get away with not doing them as much. And I think that we were doing that in spite of having what I would call a very good relationship, um, that there were still certain skills. I think we were able to kind of skate by on not, (laughs) not not developing as much. We were babies. We were also babies. I was was 22 when I met you. (laughs) Jeez. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And that's it. That's our list of the things to, um, 
kind of think that let, let me make sure I have these in place before trying to be polyamorous either on my own mm-hmm. or together with a partner. And yeah. we want to go on to our list of some things to look out for. Maybe if you see these warning signs, this is something that mm. you're not ready for yet. This section is going to be, you may not be ready to become polyamorous if. Mm -hmm. So the first one is going to be, you prioritize preserving a relationship over developing it. So this can really happen a lot with uh, monogamous couples who are now opening up their relationship. And what we mean by this is generally like the form of rules. So those rules are meant to minimize change or discomfort Uh, but they actually can often be really bad for a non-monogamous relationship. And rules Mm -hmm. uh, that we're talking about include things like you are not allowed to fall in love with anyone else, or you can't spend the night with another person, um, or, you know, other types of time restrictions. Uh, Things like only one night stands are allowed, no extended relationships, no relationships that last for a long period of time, or like don't ask, don't tell. Anything along these lines. And, and this is not to say that you shouldn't, you know, have boundaries. Uh, but but if, if you are doing these things to try to minimize discomfort uh, or you want to control the situation, then maybe that's an issue and maybe this type of relationship structure isn't for you. Because honestly, like, there's a lot of things that you cannot foresee or control. Uh, and trying to, like, have a contingency plan for all of them probably isn't a good idea. Yeah. And I think to go back to kind of the way you phrased it at the beginning, it's like, Mm -hmm. if to you just having one relationship that lasts longer is more important than growing as a person, developing that relationship, them growing as a person, developing other relationships, other relationships. Yeah. You're just kind of setting yourself up for a failure there. Um, For sure. You're kind of coming into it from a place of fear. Of like, mm-hmm. I need to protect this thing rather than I need to grow this thing, right? Yeah. To, to use a, a an analogy, it would be like if your relationship is a child that you want to protect that <laughs> child and so you lock them in the basement, uh, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. As opposed to I want my child to grow up healthy and happy and, you know, to have a good life. So I want to teach them things. I want them to grow. Mm-hmm. And I realize there's some risk involved with that, with them going out into the world, but that ultimately that's going to be better for them than the opposite, which is sheltering them from everything and just locking them in the basement. For sure. Yeah. That's a good analogy, (laughs) even though it's a little weird. It is a little weird. Relationship is like a child. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I think it works. I'll have to play with that one a little more. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. It's a workshop. Yeah. A workshop analogy. Yeah. Um, All right. The next one here is... Um, if you are planning to go into this relationship with some kind of a one penis policy or any kind of one gender policy or something that puts mm-hmm. um, kind of that limitations, that sort of limitation on it that's being imposed upon someone rather than them choosing something for themselves. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is the idea of we're going to open our relationship up, but both of us can only date women, uh, you know, saying, let's assume we're a heterosexual or bisexual couple or whatever, that we can both only date women, but not other men. And occasionally we can both date men, but not other women. That does happen. We have heard of that as well. It's just less common. Um, But in either case, it's not like you can date whoever you want. And I maybe choose to only date men or only date women, but it's saying, no, no, part of our rules is that you can't do that. Um, Mm. this one is, I feel like maybe the one that's the most common of all the things on this list, but is actually the most problematic. Um, Mm. cause, and it's like, I don't want to spend a whole hour like breaking this down cause we have had episodes where we've talked about this in much more depth. Uh, for sure. And there's a fantastic blog post on our site that Dedeker wrote on this subject as well. Um, But basically, there's a lot of assumptions going into this about what is or isn't okay for your relationship. It assumes a lot of things about gender. It assumes a lot of Mm -hmm. things actually about a lack of trust for your partner. 
And people will often argue that point, um, but it really does come down to this lack of trust. And I, again, I, I'm like trying to hold myself back. I'm like, hold me back. Hold me back. I hold wanna- me back. <laughs> hold me back. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I mean, it, that's an interesting point to make, like a lack of trust for your partner, because a lot of people will say like, well, I trust you, but I don't trust that person. Right. I trust you, but Instead I don't trust of- other men. Is yeah, like exactly. so often what we Which hear. is like. What? What the hell? <laughs> like, what are you saying right now? Right. Yeah. It's, it's like a, it's a ridiculous argument to make. Right. You're kind of making the assumption that your partner somehow has no say in their relationships or yeah. what happens in those relationships or that they're gullible and naive and can be taken advantage of by anyone. Exactly. Or possibly even worse, you're just assuming that like everyone they date is just going to unconsensually have sex with them or rape them or do things to them. It's like, it's really awful. It's like a terrible road to go down, but Mm -hmm. people think it's okay to say something like this or to feel something like this. And I've heard so many different ways of justifying it. um, And it, it's all comes down to bullshit. Um, So Mm -hmm. anyway, we won't get into it a ton more here, but that is a big, huge red flag. If that's something you're going to do. If you want to do that, don't, don't Don't. be non-monogamous. Just just don't. Yeah. No. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And this can kind of go along with that a little bit, like if you are just searching for the hot bi babe out there, Mm. um, and if you only want to date the same person at the same time, like if you, again, are an established monogamous couple, and you're deciding, like, we're just going to go find someone to date together, uh, you know, this, this can, like, kind of seem like a really good way to not get hurt. Like, we will always go on dates together with this person. We'll always have sex at the same time with this person. Uh, Then, you know, I won't be jealous. It won't be as difficult for me because I won't be sitting on the couch thinking, like, what is my partner doing Mm -hmm. with their date right now while I'm sitting home alone eating bonbons? (laughs) That sounds great. (laughs) I would love to sit at home and watch her and eat bonbons right now. Eat bonbons. (laughs) What is a bonbon? Like... People always say that, but I can't even like picture what a bonbon is. They're like little like chocolates with fillings inside. Really? Yeah. That sounds tasty. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe you do want to do that, but <laughs> but yeah. But still. But yeah, your point yeah. of like that you think it's going to protect you from all those things. Absolutely. But more often than not, a lot of emotion can come up when you are dating the same person. When you you and your partner are dating the same person at the same time, like still jealousy can come up. Still, it can be really difficult to like see your partner have sex with that person when you're you know not penetrating them at that moment or whatever. So, <laughs> I'm just saying, yes, yeah. it can be really challenging. Like even in the in even in the bedroom, even in the moment, obviously. So yeah, I I think you need to have the ability to let relationships grow and flourish without you being there watching the every, every single move that that relationship makes. And if you're not comfortable with that, then this isn't something that you should be doing. Yeah. This, this one, uh, I I wish Dedeker were here to share it, but her, Mm. her litmus test question that she likes to give. Oh yeah. That one. Yes. Is to ask yourself, would I like, okay, if, my partner and I want to start dating this third person to ask yourself the question, would I be okay if this other person were to, to date my partner completely separate from me where I wasn't involved in the sex or that romantic relationship. And if your answer is no, you're not ready yet. Even if the three of you are all going to date each other, you have to be able to answer yes to that question and really be okay with that. Um, Yeah. Because, I feel like this one's kind of similar to the the one penis policy or like the one gender exactly. policy where there's kind of a lot of assumptions built into it already and kind of a lack mm-hmm. of this one I think also has like a lack of understanding the humanity of the other people involved in your lives. Yeah. It's kind of treating them like they're just a thing to be used by you. And I know a bunch of people just like slammed their drinks down and are like, no way, like that will treat them good. And a lot of people say that, but like there's too much inherent in this idea that you have to date the two of us. And if you feel differently about one or the other of us, you can't date either of us. 
Yeah, it's, and we're oof. like a unit, and we we you know win out over everything else. So even if you're having a hard time, and we decide like, sorry, we're done with you, then you know that's that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a really shitty way to treat a person. It really is, and you're just yeah. not setting yourself up for success. Like, yeah, you're just you're gonna have problems even if you don't realize it yet. So take absolutely doesn't mean you can never do it. Just take some time reevaluate these things and get yourself to a place where that's not an assumption you're going in with. Yeah. And I think if you want to be in a triad that it, it, happening organically, regardless of you just being like, we're trying to find a third mm-hmm. like that, I, I think is the best way in which to have a, a relationship with three people simultaneously. Yeah. I'd and you're that. having multiple you, well, you, like we always say, you have multiple relationships in a triad. Mm-hmm. It's a relationship with each of the people separately, and then also the triad relationship. Yeah. So, and the fact yeah. that over time it could change from being just one partner dating sure. to both dating separately, more like a V, to then being a triad, to maybe going back to just some dating. In order for this to like last and grow, all of those options need to be on the table. They need to be okay yeah. options, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It can't just be like one or the other yeah. or nothing. Okay. Our next warning sign is if your only support network is your monogamous partner. Um, and if you're a single person right now thinking like, is my only support network, whoever I'm dating at the time, right? That, that qu- yeah. applies either way. Um, and this one is, I feel like it's pretty simple right there, but uh, I think it hints at some elements of codependency which again, mm-hmm. I think codependency is something that's actually very praised in our culture. And I don't think mm-hmm. that if you do this, I don't think that means something is wrong with you. I think you've probably just learned some habits and some thoughts and some beliefs that are not actually very healthy, but are very normal. Like if that makes yeah. sense, like it is very common and very normal. And so no one else is going to call that out, but not actually the healthiest thing for you. And when you try try doing something like polyamory or non-monogamy that's going to come and bite you because all of a sudden it's like i have no other place for support besides this yeah i mean friends are important in everyone's life Mm -hmm. but it's especially important to find a good support network outside of your partners just people that you can talk to people that understand what you're going through, Mm -hmm. especially like if you can find some people who understand polyamory as well uh, and that are supportive of it and aren't dicks about it. (laughs) That would be really lovely. Yeah. And and it's challenging at times. I mean, you, you sort of have to insert yourself into polyamorous communities and, and go out and try to meet people who are polyamorous, but it's incredibly imperative to have a support network who understands what you're going through because it's not the relationship structure for everyone. Mm -hmm. And you might get a lot of backlash from family members, from friends who've always known you as monogamous. Yeah. Uh, And you really can't put all of that on your partner. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's not fair and that's not nice for them either. Yeah, it's also just, I mean, regardless of your relationship type, it's just a bad way to be anyway, because if you need support yeah. on something about that relationship, the person... You're not going to like... Yeah. They're not going to be a good source of support for you. And I know I no. definitely have been guilty of this in the past, of mm-hmm. trying to have my partner be my support network for problems with that same person, right? Like, that's totally. just not not a great thing. Uh, and this community, this support network could also be online. Right. If yeah. if you don't have people in your immediate world who get this and are supportive of it, it is something you could also find online. Totally. Yeah. So the next one is going to be you let your partner make life decisions for you or you feel like you need to make your partner's life decisions for them or, or try to convince them what is right for them. Ugh, this one's tough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to the independence thing. Like, if you entangle your life so much that you decide for each other always, like, what what you two collectively are going to do in your life, and that's it. And I know that some couples operate like this, for sure. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not a good good thing to 
continue practicing if you're going into a non-monogamous structure just because you you don't know what's going to happen like so you kind of have to go through go, go with the flow in that type of structure uh and just deciding like hey i'm going to make all of these decisions for you or you're going to make these decisions for me it's yeah it, it doesn't work it really doesn't i think this is question to ask yourself is also a good test about codependency similar to the yeah. thing about your support network if it's just that one person um, or if it has just been that one person in the past i think this one's kind of similar where it's like you're you either don't you don't kind of allow them to make their own decisions or they don't allow you to make your own decisions, that that's a red flag for something yeah. that's going to become a big, a bigger problem. This is already a problem and this is something that you should definitely address and take a look at. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, look up some stuff about codependency and things like that. But um, mm -hmm. I think it's just a good question to ask yourself. Um, and I think I've fallen into this trap before of kind of, mm. um, not feeling like I could make any of my own decisions. Um, Interesting. Like you have to consult your partner before you do anything kind of thing. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, from any kind of life decision to mm -hmm. uh, two things about other relationships, right? Like in any, in any way. And yeah. I think that it's something where it's like, you could look at it positively and say, well, it's just, you know, I'm respectful and I want to get my partner's opinion or I trust them and they're a great confidant, all those things. And I know that for me, like those things are all true and I still have those mm -hmm. aspects with my partners and with my friends that I do really value their feedback, but it's yeah. like finding the point where I'm not, you know, kind of letting them dictate all of my decisions and kind of, they are the whole process. Instead they are, yeah kind of consultants to my process um that sure. that one's been a challenge for me um and i yeah. think is honestly still a no, work in I progress important. yeah yeah i get that i know it, that's kind of a fine line like being respectful versus being like but i'm my own person and like you don't get to dictate what i do in my life kind of thing yeah because yeah i mean we've we've seen this happen with primary relationships where they're like well I'm unilaterally making a decision for the both of us that like, we yeah. are not allowed to do X. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And so in all of your relationships, you're not allowed to do X with this person kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Without, without like consult. I mean, maybe you consulted, but sometimes you, you don't. And it's just like, I have veto power over this sexual act or whatever, mm -hmm. or like, because I'm the primary, that means obviously you're not allowed to do this thing with other people yeah. and it's bullshit and <laughs> yes. not nice and awful. And yeah, we've seen it backfire spectacularly in various ways. So yeah. don't do that. Yeah. Maybe don't do that. Yeah. All right. The next okay. one, the next one, and I think is actually uh, very related to that last one, mm -hmm. um, but kind of expands a little further. And that is if you, feel like you are not able to say no. And this could be mm. to your partner or to other people in your life. Um, yeah. That if you're not able to actually say no, this one I think is just going to make a lot of things more difficult moving forward. And I think mm -hmm. you really owe it to yourself and you will thank yourself, your past self for this in the future. <laughs> Uh, if you do some work on this and really kind of explore this, try to learn a little bit more about this, understand what's going on. Um, just that it kind of comes back to the idea of being able to make your own decisions, but it's being able to say no. And I think it's something that we're often not taught very well how to say no. Right. Cause yeah, as I completely agree. As kids, like saying no isn't really an I'm option. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like as kids, it's not an option, right? It's like you do what your parents say and like that's that, right? There's not yeah. like, there's not usually that shift where suddenly your parents start teaching you it is okay to say no. Instead, they're like, when you learn to say no, when you're like three years old, they're like, we're going to stop this shit right now because it is annoying as fuck. Uh, and that's true. <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to deny that. <laughs> you're like, it is. However, however, yeah. we usually don't then take the time later to teach. No, actually, that is an important thing to be able to do. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I agree. It, it is important. And just for your own sanity, I think, for for the sake of being able to say, like, hey, I, I overbooked myself this week. I have way too many things going on, and I really need to just, like, cut the cord and not do anything mm-hmm. for a week yeah. or, or not do anything for a couple days to be able to say that. And I am terrible at that. So much so that like, I will take way too many jobs on at once Yeah, you do, <laughs> and not be able to say no. Like all of those things are, it's just an important skill to have. So learn it now if you don't have it, because especially in non-monogamy, it's an important one to have. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah. Um, and so our last one finally is going to be you do non-monogamy for your partner or just to save the relationship. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to be ready for this type of structure if you're doing it just to save a relationship or just for your partner. It's not not the way to go. Um, I think a lot of people get into non-monogamy because they realize like a relationship is failing and they want... They see their partner interested in other people or their partner may be like, I think I'm polyamorous, so I really want to try this out. Mm -hmm. Um, And you say, okay, I I don't like that idea at all, but I'm going to go along with it because it's better than losing you. And I think that can really often be a recipe for disaster. Not always, because obviously like, you may find that you love it as well, or you may find that you love it more than your partner does. Definitely heard that story but, before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But there is always this possibility that that's not going to be the case. And if it really like makes you sick to your stomach, or if you, you know, know for yourself, like I am a monogamous person, but I want to try this anyways, just to make them happy. That's probably not going to work out. It may not. Maybe it will, but probably not. Yeah, I feel like this one really touches on something that uh, you were mentioning earlier, Emily, about like prioritizing preserving a relationship over developing it. Yeah, And I think yeah. that this one's hard because I feel like within the monogamous world, we're taught so much that the success of a relationship is based purely on how long it has lasted. Oh, yeah. And I think this really falls into that. It's like, well, I have to do this to keep this relationship going, even if maybe we want totally different things in our life. And I think that's, uh, I I get it. Like, I've been there about certain things in my life, not about polyamory specifically, but about other aspects of my life where it's like, well, I don't really want to do this. Like, this isn't right for me, but I need to keep this relationship going because in my head, it's like, well, that's just what you do. Like all of your decisions should just be to keep a relationship lasting longer more than anything else. Um, and so unfortunately I think with this one, it's like, if this really is truly a place where the other person is like, yes, this is what's right for me. And you're like, no, this is definitely not for me. That, that's not a situation where it's like, oh, just by like communicating right or doing the right thing, we can make this relationship last longer. But this might be a case where you realize that actually this relationship, either ending or maybe changing into something different, um, you know, meaning a different type of like less entangled, maybe not no longer romantic or no longer sexual or kind of whatever that is for you that that might actually end up being the best thing for you in the long term, because it's allowing you both to be honest and make your own decisions and be the kind of person and have the types of relationships that are right for you, even if it might mean changing that relationship. And that's a hard thing to, to accept, but I've definitely found from experience in my own life when I have gotten there, whether it was by my choice or theirs, it usually ended up being for the better. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And that's I agree. That's a tough one. But yeah, but definitely true. Cool. And that's the list. Yeah, I hope these were helpful. And again, it, the the top ones, the ones about like maybe you are ready if you do all of these things. Like Jay said, you don't need to possess all of those qualities. You don't need to actively be doing every single thing on that list in order to be ready for non non monogamy. Mm -hmm. And likewise, if there are a couple things from the list of maybe you're not ready, 
if, if you know that you're doing those things, you know, it doesn't mean that 100% you are or you aren't ready for non-monogamy, but at least, like, take a look at them, think about it, uh, mm. it, it think about, like, why you want to implement a one-penis policy into your relationship, or why you want to only have your partner and yourself dating the same person at the same time, and think about maybe changing that, because you can still have a great relationship with your current partner, uh, while also having a great relationship with other people. Yeah, I think that um, the, I think it's also important to keep in mind that none of this is like this isn't like a quiz in Cosmo that's like fill out this questionnaire to decide if you're polyamorous or not. Yeah, this is sure. just questions of like, are you in a good mental and emotional place to try yeah. transitioning into non-monogamy? Because yeah, you know, unfortunately. These are not skills that we're taught. These aren't options that we're given. They're stuff that we have to find later on. And for those of you who did grow up with these as options, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Um, I was not one of those people. I know most of us were not brought up with these things being options or these things being talked about. No. Um, but uh, that it's just sort of a like, hey, these are things maybe to work on, to look at. It's not like a, you can never do this because of X, Y, or Z, because we're changing all the time. So what about you? What has been your experience with either these positive signs or these red flags, these warning signs? Have you had more of one or the other, any of that? Uh, we would love to hear from you and have that kind of discussion. Yeah, and the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook or discourse forums. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. Leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-0-5. Or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Jace Lindgren, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com.